But to have your love forever is a real and lasting treasure. You alone will. Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans and you're watching the John Cedars channel from the bunker and this is the first of a series of six videos in which I will be taking a look at the 2020 Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses which has been given the title Always Rejoice. Now in this video in particular I will be reviewing the Friday morning of the convention. Now there is a lot of material I need to comment on, so without further ado, let's roll the first clip. So what we've just been looking at is a few seconds of the introductory music video segment that gets played to Jehovah's Witnesses at the start of the session. Usually these music videos would be an opportunity for Jehovah's Witnesses to stop talking to each other and find their seat in readiness for the program. What the organization is now doing is using this period to show videos with quite emotional music that will be familiar to Jehovah's Witnesses, usually sung in different languages, to highlight the international aspect of the organization. And I thought it was interesting just to give you a sample of what's being played at this convention, because it's really playing on the persecution element of Jehovah's Witness propaganda. Jehovah's Witnesses need to feel persecuted for their religion to make sense. They believe that if no one is persecuting them, then they can't be the one true organization chosen by God because Jesus said that those who follow him would be persecuted. So when they have evidence of persecution, whether it's in Russia or whether it's in some other country from the past, they typically jump on this and tend to relish any evidence of oppression in various lands, past or present. Welcome to the 2020 Always Rejoice Regional Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. From the start, we wish to convey to you greetings from the governing body and the entire Bethel family. And we want you to know that we love you and we keep you in our prayers. So now, whether you are watching this from home or from some other location, this is our convention for 2020. And what an encouraging theme. Always rejoice. We need to discuss this subject now more than ever before, don't we? Is it possible to rejoice as the world crumbles around us? Yes, it is. Those who love Jehovah can always find reasons to rejoice. So this is Kenneth Cook, a governing body member, taking us through the chairman's address for the Friday morning. The chairman's address usually sets the tone for the convention and explains to the audience what they can look forward to on each of the successive days ahead. And Kenneth Cook has the task of welcoming everybody the title of his chairman's address is Why Jehovah is the Happy God. I hope you noticed there some of the very peculiar language. He said, is it possible to rejoice 
as the world crumbles around us. Yes, it is. So this is the mindset of Jehovah's Witnesses, that the world is crumbling around them, rather than seeing themselves as a part of the project of humanity and feeling that they have some involvement in moving humanity forward, moving society forward, they feel that the world is irredeemable, it's doomed, it's crumbling. And the only way to escape this erosion, this entropy, this decay, is to stick as closely as possible to what they consider to be God's one and only true organization. Now let's lay the foundation for all of this by first answering the question, what is true joy? What is commonly called joy is an emotion that is stirred by a feeling of well-being, by a sense of success, or because of expecting something good. And for this reason, joy may seem to come and go depending on what is happening around us. You might call it circumstantial joy. But that is not the case with true joy. Why? Because true joy, godly joy, is an aspect of the fruitage of God's Holy Spirit. True joy is a quality of the heart that is not dependent on external things happening around us. This godly quality comes from knowing that you have the truth, that you are doing what pleases God, and that your kingdom hope is certain to be fulfilled. So then, we see there's a big difference between having circumstantial joy and having joy of Holy Spirit. This is very interesting because I hope you'll notice that already, just a couple of minutes into the convention, they're reinventing the word joy <laughs> to suit them. So most outsiders who might be attracted to this convention, granted it's not really being seen by outsiders this year due to the pandemic, but if outsiders were to come along and let's say watch these videos with a Jehovah's Witness family that they were friends with, they might be thinking, well this is really going to tell me how I can find joy. But already Kenneth Cook is redefining joy to the Jehovah's Witness approved definition of what joy is. So he says it's none of the things that you would normally associate with joy, such as um, a feeling of well-being, a sense of success, or expecting something good. No, no, this is true joy. This is godly joy, an aspect of the fruitage of God's Holy Spirit. And guess what? You can only find this true joy by associating with Jehovah's Witnesses. Specifically, and this was very interesting, joy is a quality that comes from knowing you have the truth that you are doing what pleases God and that your kingdom hope is certain to be fulfilled. So Jehovah's Witnesses have to believe that they have the truth. And I would agree with this. It's only going to be a remotely joyful experience being a Jehovah's Witness if you are able to believe everything that's said. But the truth of the matter is that over many decades of this religion's publications, and you'll see I have a fair selection behind me, the end has been routinely predicted and it hasn't come to pass. Generations have lived and died in this religion expecting the fulfillment of God's promises, having a kingdom hope that would never actually materialize in their expectations being fulfilled. So I find it interesting that Kenneth Cook is dismissing what he calls circumstantial joy in favor of what he calls true joy, when in fact the true joy that Jehovah's Witnesses are expected to have has routinely, generation after generation, ended in nothing but disappointment. Godly joy is not a mere personality trait that we are born with then, is it? And it doesn't come to us simply because of pleasant circumstances. 
joy of Holy Spirit is found deep within us, and so it should not be confused with simply being cheerful or exuberant. Godly joy is not superficial. It's not found in constantly smiling or laughing. To show the difference, think of a comedian who seems to be able to find what is funny in just about any situation in life, yet deep down inside, he may be very unhappy. In contrast, like the Christians in Thessalonica, we can have joy of Holy Spirit even when we are under tribulation. We may not smile through a bad time, but our deep inner joy in serving Jehovah is immovable. It's part of the new personality that true Christians put on in order to be like Christ. This, again, is a fascinating example of redefining a word to make it suit you, because Kenneth Cook will know, as someone who has spent many years in this religion, he wasn't raised as a witness, he was introduced to the religion as a young man. Nevertheless, he spent decades acquainting himself with what it means to be a Jehovah's Witness, and he will know that there are lots of Jehovah's Witnesses who are sad. There are lots of Jehovah's Witnesses who struggle with depression, with anxiety, with various mental health issues. So he knows that he, if he's going to stand in front of a convention audience, in this case a convention audience numbering millions, and tries to tell Jehovah's Witnesses that the true joy of being a witness involves being happy all the time, he knows Jehovah's Witnesses are going to be looking at each other <laughs> and saying, mm, we're not seeing that here on the ground. We're seeing actually lots of depressed Jehovah's Witnesses. So again, the way around this for Kenneth Cook is to reinvent what joy means and basically manage expectations. So we see him saying there, the joy of Holy Spirit should not be confused with simply being cheerful or exuberant. Don't expect to be cheerful or exuberant as a Jehovah's Witness. He says, Godly joy is not to be found in constantly smiling or laughing. Don't expect smiling or laughing <laughs> due to this true joy. And he further says, We may not smile through a bad time, but our deep inner joy in serving Jehovah is immovable. Again, with such a flexible definition of what joy is, this joy characteristic becomes unfalsifiable, doesn't it? Because if you point to a Jehovah's Witness and they don't have a smile on the face, in fact, they look very sad and depressed, you can say, ah, yes, but they still have joy you just can't see it because it's an inner joy that's immovable. Now, with this basic understanding of godly joy in mind, let's give our attention to Brother Stephen Lett, a member of the governing body, as he welcomes us to this Always Rejoice Convention. And please listen carefully as he explains why godly joy is such a special quality. Welcome to the Always Rejoice Convention of Jehovah's Witnesses. We're so happy that you were able to arrange to attend all three days of this convention. Godly joy is a deep-seated quality of the heart. It's a state of happiness that remains whether the conditions around us are pleasant or not. In fact, a person can be disturbed about something, but still have joy in his heart. For example, the apostles were flogged for speaking about the Christ, yet they went out from before the Sanhedrin rejoicing because they had been counted worthy to be dishonored in behalf of his name. Obviously, they weren't rejoicing over the flogging they had received, but as servants of God, they found true joy in keeping their integrity 
to him. So godly joy is not the transient joy that people experience because they've secured a well-paying job, gone on an exotic vacation, attained fame and prestige, or acquired some coveted material item or large sum of money. No, true joy has to be cultivated by means of Holy Spirit. To obtain Jehovah's Holy Spirit, we have to draw close to Him and give Him exclusive devotion. We're getting down to the true narrative now of this convention. We've already had joy redefined to be some obscure inner quality that you can't necessarily detect. And now joy is supposed to be attached to keeping integrity and giving Jehovah exclusive devotion. So already we've moved from what should be a fairly obvious word, joy, meaning happiness, to a reason for witnesses to be reminded of their need for obedience, which if you think about it, is basically the theme of every single convention. Now though, it's time for the first symposium of this convention, titled What Contributes to Joy? And taking us through the first part on this symposium is Leonard Myers, who is a helper to the writing committee of the governing body. He's going to take us through the theme, What Contributes to Joy? A Simple Life. The opening song of our convention program reminded us that our reasons for joy are abundant and that true joy is well-founded with roots reaching deep in God's Word. Just as a tree anchors itself in the earth's nourishing soil, so true joy is anchored in the sayings of Jehovah. And those sayings promise us joy that will last forever. But isn't it also true that Satan's world promises to give us joy? Yet any measure of joy derived from things in Satan's world, such as pursuing wealth, wrongdoing, extreme views of work, or friendships in the world, is a false joy that is short-lived. Think back to our illustration of the tree. Can a tree survive if its roots have been poisoned with chemicals? Of course not. Well, how long will we experience joy if we seek it in this poisonous world of Satan? Not long at all. This symposium will contrast what the world teaches about joy with what God's Word teaches. As you listen and watch, consider these questions. Why do the world's ways of finding joy not work? And am I pursuing what truly contributes to joy? In this talk, we'll discuss how pursuing a simple life contributes to joy. The world teaches that pursuing wealth and having money will make you happy. Does it, though, Leonard? Does it? I mean, this is one of many similar statements that we're going to see laced throughout this convention, where the speaker will just say something that would make sense if you were a Jehovah's Witness and you had been basically absorbed in this very insular us versus them mentality over many decades. But when you actually take a step back and review what's being said objectively, it's bonkers. <laughs> so he says, the world teaches that pursuing wealth and having money will make you happy. The world teaches that pursuing wealth and having money will make you happy. Well, who or what exactly is he referring to when he refers to the world? What authority is speaking on behalf of everyone who lives on the planet and saying that pursuing wealth and having money will make everyone happy? If you think about it, it's a very silly thing to suggest that there is one entity or one spokesperson for seven or eight billion people living on the earth that dictates to them what will make them happy. That's simply not happening. You can, if you want, point to examples 
of, I don't know, advertising or maybe movies that point to wealth or money as providing happiness. But you could also find, I'm sure, examples of literature or movies or poetry that warns against materialism, that warns against the fleeting joy that can be derived from money. So what he's saying is quite simply not objectively true. He's just he's just feeding the narrative, the us versus them narrative that Jehovah's Witnesses are by now used to. I hope you also notice this continued redefining of what joy is and basically dismissal of what most people might consider to be joy. Yet any measure of joy derived from things in Satan's world, such as pursuing wealth, wrongdoing, extreme views of work, or friendships in the world, is a false joy that is short-lived. Again, I'm not sure people are pointing to extreme views of work as a source of joy, but notice how he also works in there friendships in the world. Apparently, the joy that people have through friendship, people who are not Jehovah's Witnesses, when they have friends and they experience joy from being with their friends, this isn't joy. This is fake. Because how could these people possibly be happy if they're not Jehovah's Witnesses? And he goes on to say, the world is poisoned. How long will we experience joy if we seek it in this poisonous world of Satan? Well, how long will we experience joy if we seek it in this poisonous world of Satan? This is astonishing language. Again, we're just a few minutes into the program here. And any neutral bystander who's watching this, wondering what Jehovah's Witnesses are all about will immediately see, hopefully, the black and white doomsday us versus them cultish mantra that Jehovah's Witnesses are routinely subjected to in their propaganda. Please turn there with me. Luke chapter 12. In the illustration, the land of a rich man produced well. He planned on building bigger storehouses. And notice Luke chapter 12 verse 19, what the man said to himself. You have many good things stored up for many years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, enjoy yourself. So the man thought that because of having many good things, he could enjoy them for many years. But notice what God told him according to verse 20. Unreasonable one, this night they are demanding your life from you. Who then is to have the things you stored up? So in reality, the man's joy from pursuing wealth was short-lived. There's two things I need to say about this. First of all, this is one of a number of examples that I can point to of bad ideas or bad advice in the Bible. I did a video on this with my friend Alex O'Connor, or Cosmic Skeptic, as many of you know him, where we looked at some of the dodgy teachings that you can find in the New Testament. I mean, looking at Luke chapter 12, verse 19, if you were to apply those words in 19, verse 19 and 20, no one would be saving for the future. No one would be putting away money for a rainy day. There would be no thrift. There would be no caution in financial planning. This would be a very harmful thing if people were to truly follow this particular principle. But this brings me to my second point, which is that one organization that definitely doesn't follow this principle is the leadership of Jehovah's Witnesses, specifically the legal entities that have been set up, such as the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York. I've done a video on their investments because these entities actually take money from investment funds, from hedge funds. It's not completely certain how these funds were set up. In my view, it's more than likely that many of these funds were inherited by the organization 
perhaps through witnesses dying and bequeathing these investment funds to the organization. Nevertheless, the organization profits from investment funds and yet here it's telling millions of Jehovah's Witnesses well we wouldn't want to save money would we? We wouldn't want to derive any kind of safety or happiness or satisfaction from storing away riches that we can later benefit from in the future which is what this verse is talking about. To further illustrate this point as you watch the following dramatization consider how a brother responds to an offer of more money and how it affects his joy. You wanted to see me? Yeah, come on in and go ahead and close the door, please. Thanks for coming up. Yeah, absolutely. And hey Ben, all of your projects have come in on schedule and under budget. We're really impressed, and we want to move you up to the management team. Now, wow. <laughs> you'll head up the whole division to start. Management team? I like the sound of that. Not to mention the pay raise and the bonuses. It did sound like a lot more work, but Victor was so positive. There may be a little overtime here and there, but I wouldn't worry about it, not with your skill. He told me I could think about it before deciding. But come on, <laughs> this was a no-brainer. The new position was great. And the money? Well, that wasn't too bad either. It was exciting to work directly with clients. But the hours were crazy. right thing to do are seldom the same. We see an example of this in this week's Bible reading. True worship, the right thing, was not easy, but required hard work. King Hezekiah demonstrated his zeal for Jehovah's worship. So a question for the audience is, how could we explain this to someone? Abel, please. Most nights, I was wiped out. All around the world, many people wonder if life has any purpose. And I have to admit, even when I wasn't working, twenty minutes, I was working. As highlighted in the video, why will pursuing money not make us happy? Because we wouldn't be following Jehovah's advice. And that would cause us to fall into a snare or trap, as mentioned at 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. Without our even realizing it, that snare can consume our time. Time that we need to be spending on spiritual things. And that's what all of this is supposed to be about. So we now have a series of dramatizations involving this character, Ben, the purpose of which are to remind Jehovah's Witnesses that they are only going to be happy and satisfied and fulfilled. They are only going to have a balanced life if they do everything that the organization expects, even if it means turning down employment opportunities. And what the organization has done is create this very blatant propaganda which spins this situation where Ben is offered a promotion. As with all propaganda, we're dealing here with hyperbole. So the bad things that Ben experiences through accepting the promotion are exaggerated and we're going to see a comparison where he doesn't accept the promotion and the benefits of refusing the promotion are exaggerated. In other words, a fictitious situation has been invented for the purpose 
of manipulating Jehovah's Witnesses. And isn't that essentially what we see in convention after convention after convention? However, did you notice how pursuing money was a snare for him? Most nights he was exhausted from working long hours. He arrived late to the meeting and fell asleep. And did you notice what happened to his participation in the field ministry, the most important work on earth? It suffered, didn't it? He wasn't prepared, and he experienced interruptions from his workplace. It's true that money is useful. We need it to buy food, shelter, and clothing. But trading spiritual things for wealth is always a poor investment. On the other hand, a life focused on serving Jehovah is a simple life that brings deep and lasting joy. I want you to notice how a fictional character that Watchtower has invented in a fictional situation that Watchtower has also invented is being described as though he's a real person. Did you notice how pursuing money was a snare for him? Most nights he was exhausted from working long hours. And his experience, which again is all fictional and all invented, purpose built by Watchtower to express their agenda, to convey their narrative, it's all being referred to as though it's real and as though witnesses ought to base their decisions on the experiences the contrived artificial experiences of a contrived artificial fictional character. This happens, we're going to see, time and time and time again. The speaker will be referring to Ben or to whoever else and saying, oh, well, we wouldn't want to make this mistake, would we? Again, they have created the mistake. They have created the thing that they're talking about for the purpose of manipulating people. What's hilarious is that I'm going to show you an example later on where all you need to do is go back one convention and you see an example of two made-up stories contradicting each other. So again, the agenda here is to tell witnesses don't accept promotions, don't accept anything that's going to conflict with your service to Jehovah. We heard there the field ministry described as the most important work on earth. And did you notice what happened to his participation in the field ministry, the most important work on earth? In other words, service to Jehovah comes first, but anyone who's been a Jehovah's Witness for any length of time knows that just as it's easy to overdo it with secular employment, it's also easy to overdo it with your quote-unquote privileges and responsibilities as a Jehovah's Witness. You could just as easily create propaganda that paints in a bad light someone who is being unbalanced in the extent to which they are fulfilling what's expected of them as Jehovah's Witnesses, but there will be an example of this later on. If we focus our life on material things, they could take up a lot of our time and energy, and we may not take time to pray, study, or preach. How much better to follow Jesus' instruction and keep our life simple. By focusing on putting God's service first in our life, we'll have true joy. As you watch the following dramatization, consider how our brother gains joy when he makes a different decision. We're really impressed, and we want to move you up to the management team. Wow. Now, you'll head up the whole division to start. Victor's offer really took me by surprise. And wow, the perks were tempting. But I knew there was a lot at stake. So I told him I'd talk to Lisa and get back to him tomorrow. What was this job going to mean for our spiritual goals? Would we still be able to keep our life simple? 
but it's not necessarily about keeping your life simple it's about putting service to jehovah's organization front center we heard it there from leonard myers by focusing on putting god's service first in our life we'll have true joy by focusing on putting god's service first in our life we'll have true joy does that sound balanced putting service to an organization first in your life i mean if you are in a family let's say you are a mother or father surely your children are going to come first in your life no no according to this convention we've already learned that you can't have joy you can't have true joy unless you put god's service service to the organization first in your life that's the grade that's the potency of manipulation and another example of how obvious the coercion is in this particular dramatization can be seen just by pausing the image look at this guy's office we're here being shown apparently a normal office in satan's poisonous world look at that poster on the wall of a bear and below it this is supposed to be a typical motivational poster that you're supposed to be able to find in almost any office in any work environment the slogan underneath says pursue power <laughs> so apparently this is what worldly bosses are like they are obsessed apparently with the pursuit of power and quite frankly how dare they because as we all know there's only one group of men on the planet who are allowed to pursue power power over eight and a half million followers and that's the governing body were we ready to trade our time together as a family for more money The next day, I told Victor how much I appreciated the opportunity, but felt that it just wasn't the right fit for our family. Money was tight, but we were okay. We had what we needed. Saying no to that promotion meant holding off on a few upgrades. But it also meant more time for meeting preparation. Let's go on and look at more time for the ministry. And more time for each other. Did you notice the happiness of our brother and his family? when he decided to live a simple life? So if you're presented with an offer like the one given to our brother in the video, what should you do? First, pray. Pray for help to make a decision that will be pleasing to Jehovah. Then ask yourself, will this decision complicate my life? And how will this affect the time I spend serving Jehovah? Questions like those helped our brother in the video to make a decision that brought great joy. Remember, any decision you make that promotes a simple life focused on serving Jehovah will lead to joy that is well-founded, with roots reaching deep in God's Word. So it's really not just about having a simple life, is it? And this is the most infuriating thing about this dramatization for me. It's all spun as though this is about Ben being a more responsible family man. He says there, Were we ready to trade our time together as a family for more money? So Jehovah's Witnesses will be nodding along, thinking, well, of course you wouldn't sacrifice 
your family for more money. But it's really not about family, is it? It's not about spending time with family. Everything comes out at the end there when Leonard Myers is giving his review or is telling Jehovah's Witnesses what their take-home message should be from this dramatization. He says, ask yourself, will this decision complicate my life? How will this affect the time I spend serving Jehovah? Remember, any decision you make that promotes a simple life focused on serving Jehovah will lead to joy that's well-founded. It's not about leading a balanced life. It's not about spending time with family. This very manipulative, very coercive propaganda is pointing Jehovah's Witnesses to serving the organization. Now, though, we move on to the next part of our symposium. Robert Siranko, a helper to the writing committee of the governing body, is going to take us through the theme, What Contributes to Joy? A Clean Conscience. What would you do if you were tempted or pressured to commit some sort of wrongdoing? There are many people in the world who would give in to the temptation or the pressure, especially if they felt that they could benefit in some way and they thought no one would find out about it. But would doing that really contribute to a person's joy? This was extraordinary hypocrisy here from Robert Siranko. Just listen to what he's saying. What would you do if you were tempted or pressured to commit some sort of wrongdoing. Of course, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, according to men like Robert Siranko, wrongdoing is doing any number of things that the organization have decided are wrong. What about keeping secret records on criminals? What about keeping secret records on criminals who prey on the most vulnerable within a religion. That's surely wrong. That's surely something that an organization would only do to benefit them, not to benefit the victims. And Robert Siranko has got the cheek to say there are many people in the world who would give in to the temptation or the pressure, especially if they felt that they could benefit in some way and they thought that no one would find out about it. Well, thankfully, at least when it comes to Jehovah's Witnesses and the way they are covering up crime on an industrial scale, slowly but surely, with lawsuit after lawsuit, with exposure and media pressure and royal commissions and inquiries, slowly but surely, people are finding out about it. In the previous talk, we saw a dramatization of a brother named Ben. At first, he chose to accept a promotion at work that put him under great stress. Let's take another look at him in that position and see how he handles things when his boss pressures him to be dishonest. Hey Ben, looks like you forgot to sign off on the job order. Actually, these failed that quality inspection, remember? Yeah, by like two tenths of a point. Yeah, I already talked to Steve about replacing the components and uh, we're gonna get that order adjusted and I'll have a new one for you on your desk tomorrow afternoon. Ben, there's no time for that. This is a huge account. If you don't sign off on this, you'd be hurting the whole company. What? Victor, I'm... I'm not sure that I'm really comfortable bypassing the inspection when... Ben, I'm not asking you to tell some big lie. This is a technicality. Remember, a good quarter means good bonuses for everyone, including you. I didn't want to do it. But the last thing that Lisa and I needed 
was for me to lose my job. I really didn't have a choice. If you lie, they can't believe you. And they might not I kept telling myself that it was no big deal. All lies are bad, even little ones. One lie leads to another, and they cause much harm. It's simple, right? Jehovah's people always tell the truth. Did you hear what Ben said? I kept telling myself that it was no big deal. But if that were really true, then why was he so uncomfortable about what he had done? It is because wrongdoing does not lead to true joy. Ben's conscience was not clean. It was telling him Jehovah's people always tell the truth. Do they, though? Do Jehovah's people, do Jehovah's witnesses always tell the truth well as was the case in robert saranko's earlier comments about wrongdoing about doing things that are bad behind closed doors because you don't think anyone's going to notice as long as it benefits you it's okay here again we have clear hypocrisy i've made a video about theocratic warfare about the approved strategy whereby it's okay for Jehovah's Witnesses or Jehovah's Witness representatives to tell lies when it suits the organization. And I've even found examples of Jehovah's Witness representatives, Jehovah's Witness lawyers, even a governing body member lying about the organization, lying about its teachings and policies, just to get themselves off the hook. Just to make it look as though everything's above board and there's nothing to see here, folks. So again, I'm afraid what we have here is clear hypocrisy. At times it takes real courage to be honest and to face whatever consequences may come our way. As you watch the following dramatization, see how Ben benefits from being honest. Hey, Javi. Hey, Ben. How you doing? Good. How's the job going? Oh, machine's running great. Ben, I did have a question on the specs for the Harrison job. Can we take a quick look? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, let me see here. Need a hand? No, I'm good. I What happened, guys? We got we got to do something. Um, disconnect. Okay. Oh yeah, yeah. Go Get back. it going. Dead. Pretty sure it's dead. I would just say it stopped working. Whatever you do, don't tell Victor what happened. We just got this set up last month. Why would it just stop working? It could happen. Oh. You can actually smell the coffee. I'll talk to Victor. Don't throw yourself under the bus, man. We'll help you get this cleaned up. No one will have to know. This is one of the most expensive units in the shop. You take the blame, and you're just making yourself look bad. No, it's okay. It was a mistake. I'll explain it. We need to get this back online.
In the end, I think Victor actually appreciated my honesty. And he wasn't the only one. Mark had some questions. And we had a great discussion. This time, instead of his conscience troubling him, Ben had real peace of mind. He also gained the trust and respect of others. How can you have a clean conscience? By being determined, as Hebrews 13, 18 says, to conduct yourselves honestly in all things, whether other humans are aware of your good conduct or not. Wouldn't it be nice if the governing body and the Watchtower leadership lived by the principles espoused in their own propaganda? Here we're being told, or Jehovah's Witnesses are being effectively told that it's impossible to be honest unless you're one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Well, this is an insult to the billions of people, the vast majority of the Earth's population who are not Jehovah's Witnesses, many of whom are honest when you actually spend time with them, when you interact with them you find that Jehovah's Witnesses do not hold the monopoly on honesty. Well, they don't hold the monopoly anyway, as I've already discussed, because it's enshrined in their own literature that it's okay to be dishonest when it suits the organization. We heard there one of Ben's colleagues say, if you take the blame, you're just making yourself look bad. My question is, how many times has the governing body taken the blame? They claim to be imperfect. They claim to be fallible. If that's the case, if they are truly capable of making mistakes, when have we heard them apologize? If you're a Jehovah's Witness watching this, can you point to a single example, a single example of the Jehovah's Witness leadership, past or present, taking the blame, recognizing that they've made a mistake, even though they claim to make mistakes and they claim to be imperfect? Again, they're not following their own propaganda. They do cover up their mistakes. They do hate to look bad. And as a result, rather than being open and transparent and honest, they make it as difficult as possible for Jehovah's Witnesses to know when mistakes are made. Now, though, it's time for the next part of the symposium, which is to be presented by governing body helper William Mullenfant, who serves as a helper to the teaching committee, the title of his part of the symposium, What Contributes to Joy, Meaningful Work. Work is a gift from God, and his inspired word tells us to be balanced in our view of work. However, the world teaches extreme views of work that are contrary to God's view. Some have the view that work should be avoided at all costs, and they work hard at not working. Others have the view that the more you work, the happier you will be. You have this same stunt being pulled again. We heard it earlier, didn't we, in the convention, the world teaches this. The world teaches that pursuing wealth and having money will make you happy. However, the world teaches extreme views of work that are contrary to God's view. Whoa, slow down. <laughs> Who are you referring to specifically? Because quite clearly, seven and a half, eight billion people aren't all teaching something. It's simply not objectively true to suggest that the world, the population of the planet, teaches anything. And yet here we have this expression being repeatedly used to peddle nonsense. In this case, William Malenfant, who, by the way, I ordinarily have a little bit of respect for out of all of the governing body members and helpers. 
I don't know, maybe it's the fact that he narrated some of the older videos, and so I associate, I have positive memories, shall we say, attached to his voice. But frankly, I expect better from you, William Malenfant. You're speaking nonsense here. You say, the world teaches extreme views of work that are contrary to God's view. So what are the extreme views that the world is teaching? Some have the view that work should be avoided at all costs. And they work hard at not working. Others have the view that the more you work, the happier you will be. So what he's doing is pointing to two extreme positions that some people espouse. And he is saying, he is asserting, he is claiming that this is what the world teaches. You don't get to point to the extreme views of some people and say, oh, this is what everyone's doing. Quite clearly, many people are able to find a balanced view of work. Not everyone is a workaholic or a lazy person. This is, when you think about it, a perfect example of the black and white thinking that this group encourages. You're either this or you're that. It's either black or it's white. It's either one way or the other. There is no grey. There is no nuance. Everything must be viewed through our oversimplified, dumbed-down, cultish lens. As you watch the following dramatization, notice how our brother's emphasis on secular work actually robs him of joy. The company took on new clients this year, and I knew that Victor was really depending on me to keep things on schedule. I didn't want to let him down. So I stepped up and took on the overtime hours. I figured it was temporary. And I even got to take home a bigger paycheck. The problem is, that's not all I took home. By the end of each week, I was burned out. And the weekends? Well, they weren't really any better. In fact, I spent a lot of Saturdays back at the office. The project took a lot longer than I thought. That pretty much took out field service and the meetings. But I knew that management would be impressed. That machine is essential so I can get these parts. I got the reports in right on time. Look, this is costing a lot of money. I got a first quarter that I have to meet and without this, it's gonna, it's gonna kill me. You know, we had a contract that you're supposed to, like I said, I don't care about your third party vendors. This is unacceptable. I was working harder than ever, and in the end, I'm not sure anyone even cared. We know that being industrious and working hard is good. But what did our brother in the video experience when he adopted the world's extreme view of work? Did it make him happier? If we put secular work above everything else, we could lose out on needed rest and spiritual pursuits. Our brother in the video sacrificed precious time with his family and activity with the congregation because he did not have a balanced view of secular work. It really is just quintessential hyperbole, exaggeration. It's what all propaganda is made of. I'm going to take something I don't want you guys to do and I'm going to make it look 10 times worse 
than it actually is so that you'll never even think about doing it. That's what the organization's done here. Yes, there are stressful jobs. Yes, there are workaholics. Yes, there are people who have a poor work-life balance, but that is not the majority. It is possible to have a productive balance when it comes to work, but that's not the message Watchtower wants you to take home. So they've created this exaggerated scenario where everything that can go wrong does go wrong. And again, it's seemingly about stress or it's seemingly about spending time with family and just being balanced when really there is a very clear message underpinning all of this. Again, it comes out when William Malenfant is giving his summary comments. If we put secular work above everything else, we could lose out on needed rest and spiritual pursuits. That's what it's all about. The organisation really doesn't care whether people are stressed or overworked or having a poor balance when it comes to their secular work. All they care about is making sure Jehovah's Witnesses give them everything. As you watch the following dramatization, see how our brother benefits from working hard at his secular job and in spiritual pursuits. It had been a busy week. But the weekend was going to be even busier. And better. But first, I needed to make an important stop. Oh, it's Lynn! Come in! Oh, it's so good to see you. You too. Hey, John. How are you feeling? Ben, how are you doing? <laughs> good, good. This illness had been so hard on John and Sandy. I couldn't even imagine what they were going through. It was so encouraging to see John's positive attitude. The next day, we had a fantastic conversation in the ministry. Then, Tom and I finally figured out that glitch in the AV system. Okay, Tom, go ahead and hit play. It's played. Okay. All right. Yes. Everything looked and sounded great. We definitely were busy, but in the best way possible. Doing things that really mattered, and for people who love Jehovah. We saw a balanced and joyful man in that video. Did our brother in the video that we just observed give of himself to the congregation? Yes, he did. He took the time to visit a brother in the hospital, and we know that such visits are truly appreciated, and he participated in the ministry to spread the good news of the kingdom. He helped out at the kingdom hall to get the audio-video set up working. Like him, we make ourselves available for whatever has to be done to care for kingdom interests. Again, you have a fictitious character being described as though he is real and fictitious events, a contrived, made-up storyline to tell millions of Jehovah's Witnesses what decisions they should be making in real life. But what's funny about this particular part of the dramatization 
is the organization hasn't paid much attention to continuity. You can, if you want, show another dramatization from the previous convention to show how manipulative all of this is. So the message here, again, is that Jehovah's Witnesses shouldn't be thinking about work. They should be turning down employment opportunities if these opportunities diminish their ability to serve Jehovah or to be involved in the preaching work or in helping the congregation. This is the clear message underpinning this dramatization or series of dramatizations. But what if I told you you could, if you wanted, have a dramatization showing an imbalance when it comes to serving the organization? Someone who goes too far in serving the congregation. We heard there William Malenfant say, did our brother in the video that we just observed give of himself to the congregation? Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He took the time to visit a brother in the hospital, and we know that such visits are truly appreciated. What if I told you that I can find you a video from only the last convention that depicts a Jehovah's Witness who is so imbalanced in how much he is serving the congregation and serving Jehovah that he doesn't have time to visit someone in hospital. Carl's been calling. You really should pay him another visit. Grace says he's not doing too good. I will, I promise. Just as soon as I get past this talk. I'd known Carl and Grace since I was 17. Carl had been my spiritual dad. He was always there for me. And with him being in and out of the hospital, I tried to be there for them, but I'd just been so busy. seemed like so many new responsibilities hit me all at once. Brother Capra, do you have a second? Hey, Kev, uh, maybe a little later, okay? But I figured once my schedule freed up, I'd make more time for everyone, including Carl. What I didn't realize is how quickly time can run out. Doesn't this highlight the entire problem with basing your decisions, basing the choices that you make in life on fictitious narratives that anyone can dream up to suit their agenda? Because just as easily as you can create a fictitious situation in which someone is being exploited by his company and being asked to do too much, so that he suffers, you could just as easily, and Watchtower has in fact created, a fictitious situation in which someone is imbalanced in their service of the congregation. That's the problem, ladies and gentlemen, with propaganda. You can make propaganda say anything. Ultimately, these stories mean nothing. All that matters is what is the message behind it. Watchtower can just cut out the middleman, as far as I'm concerned. They may as well just say, look, we don't want you progressing your career at the expense of our organization. They could just say that. That's what they want to say. But because they're manipulative, because they're coercive, because they're controlling, they put together and spend lots of time and resources putting together 
these extremely highly produced dramatizations which aren't uplifting and aren't edifying and aren't enlightening they are purely vehicles for pushing watchtowers narrative which is that serving the organization always comes first now though it's time to hear from james mance who is a helper to the writing committee of the governing body he is going to take us through the final part of this symposium what contributes to joy true friendships thanks to modern technology people the world over say that they have more friends than ever all they have to do is add a person's name to their list of friends on a social network some boast of having hundreds even thousands of such friends. Yet again, you have a talk being introduced with words that, when reflected on, are really utter nonsense. Apparently, people the world over say that they have more friends than ever. Who are these people? You, you have made a statement of fact, James Mance. Where is your evidence? On what basis are we supposed to believe that people the world over are saying that they have more friends than ever? People the world over say that they have more friends than ever. He also says that some boast, I'm reading obviously you may have seen the transcript, and these words may seem silly when they're being spoken in a video, but trust me, nothing beats seeing them on paper in black and white. Some boast of having hundreds, even thousands of such friends. Some boast of having hundreds, even thousands of such friends. Who exactly is doing this, James Mance? Who is boasting? Not just having hundreds or thousands of friends. We all know what he's talking about. We all know it's possible to have hundreds or thousands of Facebook friends. But he's not saying that. He's saying that some people boast, boast of having hundreds or thousands of such friends. Again, you need to give examples. You're just saying silly things for the clear purpose of manipulating people that are not objectively true and cannot be proven and you're not even trying to prove them. Maybe you might find one person or two people, or a handful of people somewhere on Twitter or Facebook who have written something along the lines of, I'm so wonderful, I've got hundreds or thousands of friends. But that doesn't mean everyone's doing it. It's not something that's relevant enough to talk about at the beginning of a convention talk on friendship that's being watched by millions of people. Having good friends is very important. So we need to ask ourselves, what is true friendship? Where should I look for true friends? How can my choice of friends affect my joy? As you watch the following dramatization, think about the effect our brother's choice of friends has on his joy. <laughs> And believe me, that's not the only dirt I have on Victor. Okay, we're listening. So last week, he's talking in his office, right? And he has no idea that I'm standing right there. And he's bragging to his buddy. About I really didn't want to hear this. Lunch with him seemed harmless, but this was anything but a building. Hey, hey, check out these guys. It's the Bible people. <laughs> Uh-oh. Don't look now. I think they have someone. <laughs> they might try to convert us too. <laughs> <laughs> what is the deal with these people? I mean, it's cool if you want to believe in fairy tales and everything, but keep it to yourself, right? Exactly. Exactly. Whoa. And those carts are everywhere now. They're all over the city. I couldn't finish my lunch. 
I had never noticed how sarcastic and negative my coworkers could be. I had always thought of them as well, as friends. But what kind of friends was I making? Did you see the brother's face at the end of the video? He didn't look very happy. Why not? The association seemed harmless. Workmates were just taking their lunch break together. But their conversation went in a negative direction. They began talking about finding dirt on a fellow worker. Then it got personal. His co-workers started to make fun of the witnesses who were preaching using a cart. My question watching that is, how come the work colleagues apparently didn't know that Ben was a witness? If Ben is supposed to be this super-duper exemplary witness dude who everyone should be basing their life decisions on, the way he's dealing with everything, millions of Jehovah's Witnesses should be calibrating their lives according to what they're watching in this video. And apparently Ben hasn't bothered to let the dudes he's working with know that he is one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I just find the whole thing so poorly thought out it's quite tedious as well, the way worldly, quote-unquote, worldly people are shown. Notice how one has what would be considered a worldly haircut, and the other has obviously a beard. Again, Watchtower is using these stereotypes and using these videos to have layers of coercion so that when witnesses are watching, they're supposed to be seeing the difference in appearance between the witness and the worldly people. It also wasn't compelling that they were observing someone going up to the cart. <laughs> because if there's one thing everyone knows, come on, let's be honest, everyone knows that it's very rare. When you see witnesses doing cart work, it's very rare, let's face it, to see someone walk up and start having a meaningful conversation. I'm not saying it doesn't happen, I'm just saying that if they were going to be observing some cart witnesses for the stars to align so that someone walks up at that exact moment is again, it's just adding layers of unbelievability. And the reason why it's all so unrealistic and uncompelling is because it's fictitious propaganda that's been dreamt up by the teaching committee or the writing committee. It's been dreamt up by Bethelites who live in this very insular community who don't have much experience of what real life is like. And they've been tasked with creating this world of Ben in which everything goes right for Ben when he does things the organization's way and everything goes wrong for Ben when he doesn't do things the organization's way. And in this case, apparently Ben is being a little bit naughty by being friends with people who aren't Jehovah's Witnesses. Because, as we all know, worldly non-Jehovah's Witnesses are the sorts of people who pry into people's private lives and act like excitable school kids when they see people doing cart witnessing. Friendships in the world are often based on selfish motives. As verse 4 says, Wealth attracts friends, poverty drives them away. Such friendships can be shallow, and they can end abruptly. One 42-year-old woman had over a thousand friends on her social network. Yet not one of those friends responded to her plea for help just before she took her own life. Friendships with the world are not only disappointing— but they can also damage our relationship with Jehovah. So, I probably should have warned you, but this talk by James Mance is probably the most disgusting talk I've heard yet from the convention. So I'm talking the whole of the Friday morning. 
this particular talk is far and away the worst. What James Mance is doing is he's trying to trick people into thinking that there's no way you could have friendships outside of the organisation that mean anything. Anyone who wants to be your friend outside of Jehovah's Witnesses wants something from you. What he's doing, and we're going to see more of this, unfortunately, as his talk progresses, is he's daring to suggest that quote-unquote worldly friendships are conditional, whereas friendships between Jehovah's Witnesses are somehow unconditional. I know that sounds crazy. But that's what he's daring to suggest. It's almost like Watchtower has realised that one legitimate criticism of the religion is that everyone is friends with everyone else on condition that they remain in the religion. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to suggest that theirs is the only pure friendship. Friendships in the world are often based on selfish motives. Again, where is his data proving this? How can you possibly say that straight-faced as though it is an objective fact? This is the sort of misinformation, I'm afraid, that Jehovah's Witnesses are subjected to. Yes, I'm sure there are some friendships in the world, in other words, outside of Jehovah's Witnesses, that are based on selfish mo motives. But how can you say that it's often the case. How can you say that the majority of friendships are based on selfish motives? You're saying something, James Mance, that is nonsense and unprovable. And then he goes on to give this really sickening anecdote of a 42-year-old woman who had over a thousand friends on her social network and no one responded to her plea for help. Yet not one of those friends responded to her plea for help just before she took her own life. He is cherry-picking a tragedy, a single tragedy, and he is using that single tragedy to say, this is what always happens. This is the norm. It is horrendous gaslighting and manipulation. Cultivating friendships with people who do not serve Jehovah is like trying to mix oil with water. It just doesn't work. Why not? Because the scriptures teach that true friends can be found only among Jehovah's people. Our Christian brothers and sisters are not simply companions or acquaintances, someone we happen to know. They are loyal friends. We can rely on them. Why? Is it because we're all the same age? Is it because we come from the same national, economic, or social background? No. Our friends in the Christian congregation stick closer than a brother because they share our faith, our values, our love for Jehovah, and our hopes. Hopefully most people watching this can see straight through what's happening here, can see the potency of the manipulation and how outrageous all of this is. What concerns me is all of the people watching this who will be agreeing, who will be nodding along. This talk will be played to millions of Jehovah's Witnesses who, because of the years or decades of indoctrination will be nodding along to statements such as true friends can be found only among Jehovah's people. You can only find a true friend among Jehovah's people, among Jehovah's Witnesses. Our friends in the Christian congregation stick closer than a brother because they share our faith, our values, our love for Jehovah, and our hopes. That is conditional friendship. So what you're saying there is, I will be your friend, I will stick to you, I will be closer than a brother, I will be loyal to you, just so long as you share my hopes, 
just so long as you share my religious beliefs. That is no friendship worth talking about. And yet again, James Mance seems to have been given the mission in this talk of giving a counter-narrative to what people like me are saying, which is that there is no such thing as unconditional friendship or true friendship among Jehovah's Witnesses. He's going to try to argue the opposite. And the true friendships that we enjoy now in the Christian congregation are going to last forever. Do you remember the brother having lunch with his workmates? In the following dramatization, watch his face closely and notice how having true friends affected his joy. I was so glad I had taken a day off from work. How long had it been since Lisa and I got to spend a whole day together in midweek service? Lisa started a Bible study. And we got to share our day with good friends. People like Sam and Chloe, They've really been there for us through the ups and downs. <laughs> Look at that! Ben, is that you? What are you doing over there? <laughs> Did you guys know about this? <laughs> I don't know where we'd be if Jehovah hadn't helped us to keep our priorities straight. Keeping our life simple. Having a clean conscience. Staying focused on work that has real meaning. and having real friends. <laughs> what more can you ask for? What more you can ask for is control of your own mind, including the decisions you make about what friends you have. This is not freedom that you have as a Jehovah's Witness, as we're seeing in this very symposium item, there is no option when it comes to friendship. You have to choose your friends from among Jehovah's Witnesses if you are one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And we hear there this ridiculous, mind-numbing drivel about Ben's friends being with him and his family through the ups and downs. Well, again, there's a limit to that, isn't there? because they're only going to be with you through the ups and downs so long as you at least profess to believing as they do. If you leave at any point, if you start doubting your beliefs, if you start missing meetings because you doubt your beliefs, notice how quickly these quote-unquote friends fade away or more accurately drop you like a ton of bricks because you're now deemed bad association because you're not in lockstep with the organization. Notice as well the continued demonization of non-Jehovah's Witnesses. The whole point of this particular segment in the dramatization is to focus on friendship and we again see Ben's workmates who, let's face it, they're not his friends in the truest sense, they're just people who happen to share an employer with him. They're people who he sees at work. And no one's suggesting that just because you see someone every day at work, they have to be your friend. That is not how friendship works. Your friendships, your relationships in life are not determined by what other names are on the same payroll as yours. But notice how these work colleagues, let's call them, are acting really unkindly. They're acting, again, quite frankly, like schoolchildren when it comes to the spectacle of Ben being there on the carts. In real life, more than likely, 
they might have something to say between each other once the door of the bar is closed, once they're out of eyesight. But it's very, very unlikely that you're going to get that sort of open mockery of someone who you know has different religious beliefs to yours. Would the same thing happen, for example, if his work colleagues had seen Ben going to a mosque with his family? Or had seen Ben going to the synagogue with his family? Possibly. But we're then into very dangerous territory, aren't we? We're then into the territory of religious hatred, really, is what we're talking about. So Watchtower is here trying to tell witnesses that all non-witnesses are bigots. All non-witnesses are the type of people who would laugh like hyenas if they saw you practicing your religion in public. The more you dwell on it, the more this whole dramatization unravels and you realize how entirely unrealistic it is. And why shouldn't it be unrealistic? Because it's propaganda. Because it's a story that's been dreamt up by some Bethelites in a department somewhere who have been tasked with driving home the organization's agenda by means of a fictitious story. What is it about our brothers and sisters that makes those friendships so special, so precious? Why do those friendships bring us so much joy? Because our friendship is based on a solid foundation. Even when we meet a fellow witness for the first time, we already know a lot about each other. Think about all the things we share in common. We worship the only true God, Jehovah. We speak the same pure language of truth. We adhere to Jehovah's high moral standards. And we have the same hope for the future. These things are the foundation of a relationship built on confidence and trust, a true friendship. What a contrast to people who do not know Jehovah. Whether their friendships are formed online, at work, at school, or in the neighborhood, friendships in the world are often based on shared interest. However, true friendships are based on common values. So this is what I was talking about previously. This is the counter-narrative to the claim Jehovah's Witnesses have conditional love and conditional friendships. We're now learning that Jehovah's Witnesses should be proud of the fact that they are united by all having the same indoctrination, all having the same hopes, all having the same false expectations as long as you all believe the same thing, that's what matters. That's the solid foundation. And then he turns around and gives the direct contrast. He says, whether their friendships are formed online, at work, at school, or in the neighborhood. Whether their friendships are formed online, at work, at school, or in the neighborhood. Friendships in the world are often based on shared interest. However, true friendships are based on common values. James Mance is daring to suggest that the majority of friendships outside of the Jehovah's Witness religion are fake, are based on shared interest. Oh, they're only your friend because of a shared interest. However, True friendships, the friendships between Jehovah's Witnesses, are based on common values. If you think about it, shared interest and common values, you could basically use those phrases interchangeably, couldn't you? You could say that Jehovah's Witnesses have a shared interest in preaching the kingdom, in living a moral life in having loyalty to Jehovah. And you could say that worldly people have common values that are not in line with what God wants of them. So <laughs> this is just, at this point, word games, isn't it? 
it's word games with a very specific objective, which is to dupe and exploit and coerce and mislead people into thinking that it is impossible to have a true friendship outside of this organization. As we've discussed in this symposium, the world claims that we can be happy if we pursue wealth, if we engage in sinful conduct, if we adopt extreme views of work, or if we cultivate friendships anywhere we can find them. Such assertions originate with the ruler of the world, the father of the lie, Satan the devil. If we look for happiness in Satan's world, we are going to be disappointed. Isn't it ironic that James Mance is here talking about lies, the father of the lie, Satan the devil, while uttering what is arguably a clear lie, or at least something that's extremely spurious and misleading. He's saying, again, speaking for the world, he's, t he's telling people what the world is saying. A again, this is the sort of language that you just swallow hook, line and sinker as a Jehovah's Witness. You never stop to think, on what basis are we saying what the world is saying? The world teaches that pursuing wealth and having money will make you happy. However, the world teaches extreme views of work that are contrary to God's view. The world claims that we can be happy if we pursue wealth, if we engage in sinful conduct, if we adopt extreme views of work, or if we cultivate friendships anywhere we can find them. These are all things that the world claims nonsense. It's just not true, objectively. And this is the standard of teaching. This is the best that Jehovah's organization can come up with. This completely anti-intellectual drivel about what the world is telling people to do. In truth, there is no world telling you what to do. You have to figure these things out for yourself. And yes, there will be people who are selfish who think that wealth is everything, who tread on other people to get success. But that does not describe everyone. Ultimately, this is clearly all about control, as we see there where he says, if we look for happiness in Satan's world, we're going to be disappointed. That's what they're terrified of, viewers. They are terrified of people leaving the organization. They are terrified of losing control over the followers because the followers have realized that actually Satan's world isn't the way Watchtower has been describing it. Worldly people are not the depraved, greedy, materialistic idiots that the organization is portraying in this propaganda. Some of them are but for the most part, you will find that you can find good friends, true friends, plenty of them, in fact, outside of the organization. Now, though, thankfully, it's time to move on in the program. We're done with this hideous symposium. We can move on to the dramatic Bible reading, which is being presented by governing body member Samuel Hurd. And it has the theme... Jehovah caused them to rejoice. Now, obviously, I'm going to spare you the entire Bible reading, which, if you're interested, is taken from Ezra, Haggai, Zechariah. But there are some interesting comments that Samuel Heard makes between the Bible readings, which I think you should look at. Now, the time has come to get pure worship back on its feet in Jerusalem. The account spans the reigns of several Persian kings, starting with King Cyrus, and it has a joyful beginning. Please open to Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 6, and follow along. Who knew Persian King Cyrus, ruler of what we today call Iran, looked suspiciously like a white dude in a fake beard? Let's read what Rehum, the chief government official and others of Israel's enemies, write to the king. Consider what kind of false accusations they make. 
as recorded in Ezra chapter 4, verses 11 through 16. Do those false accusations sound familiar? They're the same ones our enemies sometimes hurl against us today. They don't pay taxes. They work against the government's interests. They're rebellious and seditious. They're uncontrollable. All false charges, of course. And back then, they had their effect. The king orders the work halted, and temple rebuilding comes to a standstill. How sad. So again, I'm not going to get drawn into the minutiae of the Bible passages that he's referring to. I just hope you notice the way he is framing the accusations against Jehovah's Witnesses there. He's taking what was said about the Jews who were rebuilding Jerusalem following the exile in Babylon. They were apparently accused of not paying taxes, working against the government's interests, being rebellious and seditious. They're uncontrollable. Samuel Hurd says they are the same accusations our enemies sometimes hurl against us today. All false charges, of course. Well, I agree that it's very easy to exaggerate the problems with Jehovah's Witnesses and to be overly critical about Jehovah's Witnesses. But the truth is, some of these things that Samuel Heard is denying apply to Jehovah's Witnesses actually do sort of apply, especially the one they don't pay taxes. No one's suggesting that individual Jehovah's Witnesses avoid taxes, but the organisation as a whole, benefits, usually in most countries, from tax-exempt status, meaning that the organisation gets to amass a massive property portfolio without having to pay the usual taxes that they would have to pay if they were a business enterprise. And this has a knock-on effect, of course, because it means that space is taken up in a town or city that could be contributing to the local economy. If no tax is being paid on massive structures that are taking up space in a given community, that's a loss, really, to the local community. As to working against the government's interests, well, it depends what interests we're referring to. In Australia, the government is very interested in protecting children and making sure that organisations that have been found to have a terrible track record when it comes to child safety and child protection contribute towards a redress scheme. And in Australia, Jehovah's Witnesses have made it very clear that they will not cooperate with the redress scheme. Welcome back to The Sunday Project. Well, June 30 is the federal government's deadline for institutions to join the National Redress Scheme. It allows survivors to seek an apology and compensation without going through the courts. Tonight, we can reveal that the scheme has suffered a major rejection from the Jehovah's Witnesses, whose church was heavily criticised in the commission. So they are, in fact, working in at least one example there against the government's interests. So it's interesting how by trying to present this narrative of persecution and trying to make Jehovah's Witnesses feel embattled, Samuel Hurd has come up with these quote-unquote accusations which you cannot help but justifiably apply to Jehovah's Witnesses in at least some instances. Many of us today face increasing opposition to Jehovah's work. But compromising or giving up has never brought anyone joy, just the opposite. Remaining faithful brings joy, even in the face of violent persecution. But how is that possible? Consider a true life example. Picture a mother and daughter surrounded by a mob of angry men demanding that they buy political party cards. What would the sisters do? If they compromised and bought the cards, their persecutors would rejoice. But afterward, the sisters would be miserable, knowing they had denied their Heavenly Father. The sisters did not give in. 
Of course, they didn't enjoy being ridiculed and mistreated. Later, however, their consciences were clean, and they felt deep joy knowing they had remained faithful to Jehovah. I found these comments incredibly disingenuous because he gives this example, a true life example, he says, of a mother and daughter, but he gives no identifying information so that witnesses can go and do their own research to find out where this story comes from. They can find out more details. It sounds to me, even though he for some reason, doesn't have the guts to name the country. It sounds to me as though he might be talking about Malawi, because that situation centred around political party cards. I've done a video on this already, about the betrayal of Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi, because if you're watching this as a Jehovah's Witness and you don't know what happened there, and you don't know about the horrendous double standard and the way Jehovah's Witnesses in Malawi were basically thrown under the bus by the organization, you desperately need to watch that video or alternatively do research on JW facts about the Mexico Malawi scandal. Suffice to say, Samuel Hurd's characterization of the sort of treatment witnesses could expect if they didn't buy a political party card is disgraceful. He says the worst they could expect is being ridiculed and mistreated. Well, when you look in the organization's own literature, you find that it goes far deeper, far deeper than being ridiculed and mistreated and I'm trying to keep this video as family friendly as possible for YouTube purposes so I'm not going to go into what was done to Jehovah's Witness particularly Jehovah's Witness women in Malawi as a result of the stance that they were told to adhere to of refusing to buy these political party cards but Samuel Hurd should know better as a governing body member with some familiarity of the situation than to throw these words of, oh, ridiculed and mistreated, I'm sorry, that doesn't begin to do it justice. And this is an episode, a dark episode in the organization's history that if they know what's good for them, the governing body should refer to as little as possible. Jehovah compares the results of the Jews' self-centered efforts to those of a hired worker who puts his wages into a moth-eaten sack. Because the Jews are neglecting the house of Jehovah, he holds back his blessing. The results of the Jews' labor are limited, and their lives lack joy. Evidently, some try to fill that void by beautifying their own home. But material things cannot satisfy spiritual needs. Can we see the warning here for us? It's not wrong to enjoy nice things, but material things cannot bring us true and lasting joy, especially if we neglect Jehovah's work to obtain them. Remember the lesson of Psalm 127, verse 1, Unless Jehovah builds the house, it is in vain that its builders work hard on it. On the other hand, when we unselfishly seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, he provides what we really need and at just the right time. <laughs> that was possibly the most bizarre thing you're going to see on the Friday morning of this convention. I mean, what on earth? was that apparently it's wrong for Jehovah's Witnesses to buy 60 inch flat screen TVs unless unless they're using them to watch JW broadcasting because how often do we see video propaganda put out by the organization depicting families watching JW Broadcasting on a flat screen TV of indeterminate size. That's apparently okay, 
But if you're going to beautify your home at the expense of the organization, if you're going to spend lavishly on electrical items when you could be doing more for Jehovah's organization and for kingdom service, how dare you? The level of control and micromanagement in this organization is unlike anything I was familiar with even when I was a witness. I don't remember, I mean granted this was before the video propaganda onslaught that we're seeing in recent years, but I never would have imagined an instructional video telling me as a Jehovah's Witness what sort of electrical goods I'm allowed to buy or not buy without feeling bad depending on how much I've been serving Jehovah. Today, when wise and just officials similarly intervene in our behalf, we're very grateful to them, but we're most grateful to Jehovah for directing matters. As Proverbs 21 verse 1 says, a king's heart is like streams of water in Jehovah's hand. He directs it wherever he pleases. So we do not put our ultimate hope in any ruler or institution of this world. None of them can bring us permanent salvation. In fact, before the end of Satan's system, all the nations will turn against Jehovah's people, but they'll experience an outcome worse than that of tantanized. Again, you're going to have to follow along with the whole reading to find out who Tatanai was. He was basically a rabble-rouser and troublemaker who tried to thwart the rebuilding of Jerusalem. But I think this is a very interesting passage for highlighting the attitude that the organization takes when it comes to external intervention from what they would class as Caesar or Satan's world. What they're saying here is, oh, it's great when governments and courts come to our rescue. We appreciate it. Honestly, we do. But in the grand scheme of things, who really cares? Because all of these governments are going to be destroyed one day anyway. I would love to see them have this sort of attitude at, for example, the ICSA inquiry that's going on in England and Wales at the moment. I would love to see them stand in front of an inquiry or in front of a court and say, really, you'll experience an outcome worse than that of Tatanize. You're all going to be destroyed anyway. Before the end of Satan's system, all the nations will turn against Jehovah's people, and when that happens, you're all doomed. What's the work Jesus commissioned us to do today? He made it very clear in his parting words to his followers. Go, therefore, and make disciples of people of all the nations. Are we, with our hearts and hands, putting this assignment ahead of material goals? Haggai foretold that one day Jehovah's temple would become far more glorious than the one Solomon built. That prophecy is being fulfilled today. Jehovah is using our preaching to shake the nations. Millions of precious things, new worshipers, are coming to him. These are joyfully flocking to the great spiritual temple, Jehovah's arrangement for worshiping him on the basis of Jesus' ransom sacrifice. Now is not the time to focus our attention on paneled houses or on any other unnecessary pursuit. Very soon, on a day we do not expect, Satan's world will end and we will enter Jehovah's new world. And here we have laid bare the doomsday nature of the organization. Again, when you are a Jehovah's Witness, you just swallow all of this up. This is what you're used to. It's only when you leave and take a step back and view things objectively that you think, this is actually quite controlling and disturbing. He says, Now is not the time to focus our attention on panelled houses or on any other unnecessary pursuit. In other words, if it's not serving the organisation, 
it's an unnecessary pursuit. How dare you go after unnecessary pursuits when the time is so short? After all, as he puts it, very soon, on a day we do not expect, Satan's world will end and we will enter Jehovah's new world. Notice we will enter Jehovah's new world. You have to be a Jehovah's witness. You have to be comfortable with stepping over the remains of nearly 8 billion men, women and children who've been swept aside so that you can enjoy a planet to yourselves as one of only a few million Jehovah's Witnesses who've been deemed worthy of this new world. And notice as well the exaggeration of the organization's achievements. He says, Jehovah is using our preaching to shake the nations. Nations, you're feeling shook right now, aren't you? You're feeling properly shaken. Too much shaking. <laughs> Millions of precious things, new worshippers, are coming to him. I do try to keep on top of the statistics, so it could be that I've missed something here. But the last I checked, there aren't millions of people joining Jehovah's Witnesses every year. In fact, the organization released an article dated November 13th, 2019, boasting about the largest baptismal figure in 20 years. The largest baptismal figure in 20 years, exceeding 300,000. Maybe my maths isn't what it should be, but 300,000 is not millions. And bear in mind, that's just people getting baptised. That's the people coming in. They're not telling us how many people are going out. They're not telling us how that figure is offset by the number of people who go inactive, stop believing, disassociate or get disfellowshipped. They're only cherry-picking the figure that's positive, but isn't cherry-picking what it's all about when it comes to propaganda. And what you also find with propaganda is exaggeration. And here you have a classic example of the achievements of the organization being blown out of all proportion. Apparently, if you are a Jehovah's Witness, you have to believe that the organization is drawing in millions. Now, though, as enjoyable as that was, we move on to the final item on Friday morning, which is the talk Rejoice in Jehovah's Acts of Salvation. It's going to be given by governing body member Mark Sanderson. We know Jehovah delights to rescue us, to save us. We know he's moved to do so by his loyal love. But what does it really mean? Does it mean today that when any sort of trial comes our way, that Jehovah is just going to rush in, he's just going to intervene and rescue us every time? No, it does not. It does not mean that. Now, why? If Jehovah loves us and he has the power, why is it that he isn't rescuing us from every situation? Well, do you remember what Satan said to Jehovah about Job in Job chapter 1? See, Satan said, you've, you've put a hedge around Job. You've blessed everything he does. You haven't allowed any calamity to come to him. The only reason he serves you is just because of selfish reasons. He doesn't really love you. He just worships you for what he can get from you. You see, that same charge could be made about any of us if Jehovah just rescued us from everything. So what will Jehovah do? Well, when we're facing trials, it's true, in some circumstances, Jehovah may remove the trial. But in many other situations, Jehovah may strengthen us so that we'll be able to review the trial, excuse me, endure the trial. Either way, when we feel, when we experience that Jehovah is acting on our behalf, how does it make us feel? We truly, truly rejoice. You know, brothers, this is not theory. This very week, I lost my own father in death. My father was 90 years old. He had served Jehovah faithfully for 63 years. Now, brothers, this 
is a trial that every single one of us experience as God's people. But some of you, like me, we've experienced the death of a loved one during this coronavirus pandemic. I'll tell you, it's not, it's not an easy situation. But what, ha- what can we say? Well, I can say myself, we have felt the love of Jehovah in the, all of the emails, in all of the phone calls, in all the different ways brothers and sisters have found to provide the support that we need. That's been true in my case. I know it's been true for all of you who've had the same or very similar experience at this difficult time. Jehovah is giving us what we need so that we can continue on to serve him faithfully. I do obviously commiserate with Mark Sanderson. It's not nice to lose a parent. I know what it's like to lose a parent. And I will never crow or delight over anyone dying, no matter what their beliefs are, no matter what differences I have. And so I'm genuinely saddened to hear that Mark Sanderson has lost his father. And it was quite um, a personal touch to add to the talk. I've said before that I think that Mark Sanderson is anyway perhaps one of the most compelling speakers that the governing body has i mean not that they have a a great reservoir to draw from in that department but out of the choices available i personally find mark sanderson to be at least the most sort of compelling when it comes to the way he talks and the way he reasons and again he's chosen to there include uh, some personal information about his life and again, I commiserate with him. It must, however, be said that although the organization's handling of the coronavirus has been mostly commendable in that they have observed social distancing and they have told witnesses to heed what the local authorities are saying, it's not a completely clean bill of health when it comes to the way they've responded. And when Mark Sanderson was talking there, about his father dying we've learned incidentally that there are indeed hundreds of jehovah's witnesses over 700 in the usa alone so far over 700 in the branch territory i should say even though this is a pandemic that has taken lives not just of ordinary rank and file witnesses but even of the parents of one of the members of the governing body It's worth remembering the reaction when the first reports of the coronavirus reached Anthony Morris. As I told the the brothers in the coordinators committee office, you know, when we're facing these disasters and all these things, and I've been telling them for some time now, cheer up, it's going to get worse. (laughs) And so we keep a sense of humor with it, but uh, that's a fact. What, What we're experiencing right now in this uh, global pandemic, I was telling the branch class yesterday, uh, it doesn't bother me. We've been waiting for this. We knew things like this were going to happen. Christ Jesus has prepared us. Where's the shock? You can't help but wonder whether those words and the insensitive, indifferent, arrogant way in which they were delivered would be very upsetting to someone who has lost someone due to the pandemic someone like mark sanderson and i would never expect mark sanderson to turn on tony morris and to at least publicly criticize him for what he said but if we're going to talk about coronavirus let's talk about it honestly shall we and let's add a little bit of context because again i personally believe that for the most part the organization has been commendable in their response but it hasn't been perfect there has been a bit of arrogance on display at least on the part of tony morris and there has certainly been a rush to exploit the tragedy as a means of strengthening control and as a means of terrifying people that the end is here So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days 
undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days. Aside from the whole coronavirus thing, I thought it was interesting what he was saying about facing trials. If you think about it, what he's doing is he's encouraging witnesses to have it both ways when it comes to divine intervention. Apparently, if God does intervene on behalf of a Jehovah's Witness, this is proof that God is blessing the organization. And if Jehovah doesn't intervene, this is also proof. So they have a get out, don't they? Jehovah's Witnesses are here being given an excuse for every situation. They're told when we're facing trials. When we're facing trials, it's true, in some circumstances, Jehovah may remove the trial. But in many other situations, Jehovah may strengthen us so that we'll be able to review the trial. Excuse me, endure the trial. So Jehovah's Witnesses can have it both ways. If Jehovah comes riding to the rescue, you can thank him. If Jehovah doesn't come riding to the rescue, well, God just works in mysterious ways. The important thing is to just keep on rejoicing. Well, now, in the following video, I want you to take notice of this beautiful experience of a dear sister who did not have the trial removed, removed from her, but just notice how Jehovah has strengthened her to be able to endure. <laughs> I was born in Malawi in 1962. I lost my eyesight at two years of age because of an eye disease. We have to rely on the rains for the food we eat and sell as it is our only source of income. I also look after both my parents. My father is 99 years old and my mother is 92 years old. Poverty is very time consuming. There are a lot of household chores to do to keep things clean and neat, like fetching water for our daily needs. In the evening, after we've eaten, this is the time for reading. When I was young, father took the lead in our family worship, which he still does. But now, because of his failing eyesight, I read to them. I read with my fingers, so night time is no problem. My fingers are my eyes. One scripture that really touches my heart is James 5 verse 11, which says, Look, we consider happy those who have endured. Job endured his trials, and at the end, he saw all the good that Jehovah had blessed him with. This convinces me that Jehovah will act in the near future, blessing us with all the things we are lacking, fulfilling all his promises. And so I'm happy to endure. It's one thing to lie to people who are reasonably well off, either in terms of their financial well-being or their health. It's another thing, I think, when you're lying to people like this lady called Lois in Malawi, who, by the way, was blinded at the age of two by an eye disease. God can apparently let that sort of thing happen. Two-year-old girl being blinded by an eye disease, oh, that's fine. Kingdom Hall construction, oh, we need a new branch. We need the town planners to make it easier for us to access this particular plot of land. Oh, whatever you say, let me just drop everything and make my hand available to you to fix that particular problem. I'm here to change the weather when it suits you so that you can print more Bibles. I'm here to intervene in all of these other areas, but Lois, two-year-old Lois, she can be blinded by an eye disease. This is, in a nutshell, the problem I have whenever there are claims of divine intervention by this organization. And we're going to hear a few more claims in this particular talk. But Lois is here being exploited as a lady who is blind, who is caring for two elderly parents, and who 
as far as we can tell, is extremely poor. I mean, maybe you noticed there, it seems to me that they don't even have electricity. It looks like they're actually lighting lamps at night time or when it's dark. These are the sorts of people in impoverished countries that the organization is preying upon and getting them to make their situation even worse because it's bad enough being in that situation and living hand to mouth in those sorts of circumstances without also then having some organization based in America coming along and saying, oh, by the way, you need to give a bunch of your time to us. Actually, it wouldn't hurt if you also gave us a bit of your money as well. God's kingdom and his sovereignty are first in my life. It is only God's kingdom that will solve all these problems. I feel privileged that I've been able to serve as a regular pioneer for 36 years now, and I've been blessed to help 64 persons to know Jehovah. I'm so happy with Song 76. I don't see myself as poor. I have the Bible and many different publications in Chichewa Braille. We have the congregation, the ministry, and our brothers and sisters. All these things make me very happy. We are not worried about our current situation because we are spiritually rich. <laughs> Wasn't that amazing to see that beautiful experience of our sister? Now, Jehovah hasn't taken away her trial. She's still blind. She still has a very limited means. But look how Jehovah has blessed her. If there is a God, I try not to get too atheist when I'm doing these rebuttals, but if there is a God who has the power to stop a two-year-old from going blind and he's allowed this to happen anyway while intervening in less important areas in other people's lives, you can say lots of things about this God, but one thing that you absolutely cannot say is that he has blessed this woman. And again, how horrendous that on top of all of her afflictions and all of the things that she's up against in life just to get by from day to day, on top of all of that, she is being exploited by Mark Sanderson and his colleagues, by this organisation that is amassing property portfolios worth millions. And they are making this blind woman trudge around from door to door recruiting for them. She's been at it for 36 years, apparently. Goodness knows how much free labour this lady has given the governing body. But now let's look at a second video. Now we're going to watch a video where Jehovah really did step in and remove a trial from our dear brother who was in a refugee camp. Let's watch. Because of the civil war, we had to take refuge in a safer part of the country. When we arrived, soldiers took us to internment camps to hold us until they could confirm our identities. In the camps, we lived in tents, and it was unbearably hot in them. It was a struggle even to get water. We needed to wait in a queue for four to five hours every day. During the war, our eldest son was killed. It was a big loss for our family. All we could do to cope was pray to Jehovah and find comfort in the Bible. One day, the brothers from the relief committee came and informed us that a regional convention would be held. They had spoken to the camp officials requesting permission for us to go. For four days, morning and evening, we went to the officials to ask for permission, but they would not tell us if we would be released for the convention. Suddenly, one afternoon, much to our surprise, we were approved to leave the camp for five days. 
At that time, we had been in the internment camp for months. We had not been allowed to go anywhere. We were so happy that we got the permission to attend the convention. We never expected it. At the time, we had some clothes, but we had nothing for the three-day convention. However, the brothers outside the camp helped us enormously. They were with us, cared for all our needs, so we could be ready for the convention. We still wondered where we were going to stay and how we would get our accommodations. However, when we arrived, the brothers hugged us and warmly welcomed us. We were really encouraged. If all of this is true, if it isn't just manipulative, coercive propaganda, stories that have been cherry-picked to drive home one organization's agenda, if we can take all of this on face value, that Jehovah is real and this is the way he is dealing with people, what does it tell us about Jehovah? We've already heard a story of a woman made blind as a two-year-old. Apparently God allowed this to happen and is the sort of God that quite enjoys this lady spending 36 years telling other people how great he is. Again, if we take these stories on face value, next up we have an example where Jehovah really did step in, according to Mark Sanderson. Now we're going to watch a video where Jehovah really did step in and remove a trial from our dear brother who was in a refugee camp. I think if I was this dear brother, and I had a choice between my eldest son being spared death and, oh, going to a convention, I think I'd want to be with my son. If we're dealing with an interventionist God here, which apparently we are, we're dealing with a God who steps in. Jehovah really did step in. Yeah, if, if you could please arrange for me to not have to bury my child, I'd rather have that, if that's okay. Oh no, you get the privilege, brother, having buried your son, of going to a convention. That's how I'm going to intervene. That's how I'm going to bless you. Even though we faced many challenges and difficulties in the internment camp, that convention was like a nourishing meal for us. It was a real joy eating at Jehovah's table. We can never forget those moments. After the convention, a brother from the governing body gave a special talk to those from the internment camps. That talk really strengthened us. The convention helped us to be courageous, especially after we returned to the camp. Although we faced many losses, the convention not only gave us comfort, but also helped us to face the challenges ahead. Now my youngest son and I are serving as ministerial servants. And my wife has been serving as a regular pioneer for the past 17 years. She continued pioneering even while we were in the internment camp. We realized that Jehovah is always there, caring for us and sustaining us continuously. So how wonderful that our amazing God Jehovah helped this dear brother and his family so that they would be able to attend the convention. I don't think he is a particularly amazing God, to be honest, Mark Sanderson, if he is as described by your propaganda. I don't see anything amazing about making two-year-olds blind, or at least standing by and letting that happen when you can intervene. And I don't see anything amazing about an interventionist God letting this guy's eldest son die and instead intervening so that he gets to go to one of your propaganda rallies. No, I'm, I'm sorry, there's nothing amazing about that. What I am amazed at is, again, the depth that this organization will go to when it comes to exploiting even those who are really struggling with poverty and hardship around the world. The organization seems to revel in their ability to wield control even over people for whom life is a real struggle day to day because they're living in impoverished, 
unjust, unfair societies, Mark Sanderson and the rest of the governing body seem to get off, frankly, on the amount of control they have even over people who already have enough on their plate without having to worry about wasting years of their lives in servitude to some man-made organization. Now, in Revelation 2 and verse 10, Jesus is speaking to anointed Christians in the congregation of Smyrna. Now, notice what he says to them. Do not be afraid of the things that you are about to suffer. Look, the devil will keep on throwing some of you into prison so that you may be fully put to the test and you will have tribulation for 10 days. Prove yourself faithful even to death and I will give you the crown of life. Well, now what do we discern from these words of Jesus? Well, first of all, those who die faithfully and keep their integrity are guaranteed to have salvation from Jehovah. But there's something else that we can discern from these words. It tells us that during these last days, some of Jehovah's servants are going to experience death. In our modern history already, we know our brothers have been thrown into prison. Some have been tortured. And yes, some have even been put to death because of their integrity. In South Korea alone, Over a period of some 70 years, 19,352 of our brothers were imprisoned, and five of those brothers were actually put to death because of their faith. Well, what can we say about those brothers in South Korea, and those that died in Nazi Germany, and those that died in Eritrea, and those that died during the Soviet Union because of their faith? We know that their salvation is completely assured. They are completely safe in the safest place in the universe, the memory of our grand God, Jehovah. So this goes back to what I was saying at the very beginning about what I call persecution porn, this fixation with persecution. And if you think about it, the religion doesn't really make sense without some element of persecution. If you are a Jehovah's Witness and you buy into the doomsday theology, you have to believe that at some point or other the authorities are coming for you. That's supposed to happen at the Great Tribulation. And you're also supposed to think along the lines of, well, if I'm not being persecuted, I must be in the wrong religion because Jesus said his followers would be persecuted. So you're going to jump on any examples, even examples from the distant past, even examples from countries that are quite clearly in the grip of totalitarianism, countries where lots of religious minorities are being clamped down on, not just Jehovah's Witnesses. And you're going to jump on these reports and consider them evidence that yours is the only true religion. Mark Sanderson knows this is how it works, and that's why he's including this material in his talk. But I also found these words chilling from another perspective. He seems to be giving here Jehovah's Witnesses a mandate for martyrdom and as far as I'm concerned this extends beyond the whole issue of persecution. He's saying there, he's quoting from a scripture, prove yourself faithful even to death and I will give you the crown of life. Those who die faithfully and keep their integrity are guaranteed to have salvation from Jehovah. He then says, they, that's witnesses who are loyal, they are completely safe in the safest place in the universe, the memory of our grand God, Jehovah. So what he's saying is, even if you die as a result of your beliefs, you're not really dead. And this thinking informs the fanaticism when it comes to refusing blood transfusions because witnesses believe that as long as they respond favorably to a test of loyalty when it comes to a medical situation requiring blood it doesn't matter if they die 
because they are still in the safest place in the universe the memory of our grand god jehovah so they have this throwaway attitude to life which i think is very very dangerous if you think about it it's a similar mentality that you see in other branches of religion where people use the same philosophy to go out and murder dozens or hundreds of people in a single act because they think well i'm showing my loyalty to my creator and i'm going to be rewarded in the afterlife or in the hereafter it's the same sort of mentality that fuels that sort of religious fanaticism and we what we see here in mark sanderson's comments when you really drill down and read between the lines is in my opinion a mandate for martyrdom i'd like to just share one experience that that is uh, similar to many many more that we have received it comes from russia uh, one uh, of our sisters was there in the prison in Russia. Two of the female prisoners who were in the cell with her were imprisoned for selling drugs. Now, one day, these uh, two prisoners began singing songs about criminal life. Now, the sister didn't understand the language, but she just knew that the thoughts and the ideas in these songs were immoral and foul, and she just didn't want to be in that environment. So she prayed to Jehovah to help her. Well, suddenly... One of the women began singing song number 120 from our former songbook. Well, the sister was shocked. How do you know this song, she asked. Then they all sang the song together. It turned out that this woman had learned the song from her mother, who had previously studied the Bible with Jehovah's Witnesses and had memorized the song. Our sister felt the loving hand of Jehovah in responding to her prayer so quickly. Oh, brothers... It's a wonderful experience, but there are so many similar experiences where, where Jehovah has shown his hand on behalf of uh, his people in small ways and sometimes in big ways. That's how Jehovah intervenes. Two-year-old in Africa going blind because of an eye disease. Ah, no big deal. I'll let that happen. Son dying eldest son of this family in Sri Lanka. Ah, no biggie. I'll let that slip. Jehovah's Witness lady in a Russian jail. Oh no, I don't like the songs <laughs> that my fellow inmates are singing. Quick, we need to risk. This is an emergency situation. Quick, we need to give this sister a song. What we need to make one of these women sing. A I ask you, does that sound... Do you want to follow and worship a God who is like that? Whose priorities are so terrible. He has the power to intervene and stop unspeakable evil and misery and cruelty. And this is the way he apparently chooses to intervene. We're clearly hearing about a total coincidence. The woman in question wasn't even a Bible study herself. Her mother had been a Bible study and had passed on this song. The songs, by the way, can be quite catchy and they do tend to stick with you if you sing them enough. And the fact that this woman who was in this cell had remembered this song, even though she didn't believe the religion attached to it, oh, well, this must be God intervening. Or as Mark Sanderson says, our sister felt the loving hand of Jehovah in responding to her prayer so quickly. Our sister felt the loving hand of Jehovah in responding to her prayer so quickly. Those are the sorts of prayers, apparently, that Jehovah responds to, not the ones where people's lives are actually in danger or where there is unspeakable evil or cruelty. This is the sort of shallow, non-urgent request that God is apparently leaping at. Well, what do we expect in the very near future? This all-out attack of Gog of Magog will come against God's people. But when it begins, what is Jehovah going to do? Well, let me read to you just an excerpt from our pure worship book 
that just beautifully expresses what we can expect to see. Before they are destroyed, our enemies will see the sign of the Son of Man, likely a supernatural manifestation of the power of Jehovah and Jesus. The opposers will see things that cause them extreme anxiety. As Jesus foretold, people will become faint out of fear and expectation of the things coming upon the inhabited earth. To their horror, they will realize that they miscalculated when they attacked Jehovah's people. They will be forced to know the Creator in His role as military commander, Jehovah of armies. Jehovah will no doubt unleash heavenly armies and natural forces in such a way that he protects his loyal servants but eliminates his enemies. What a powerful description. It just reminds me of our video a couple of years ago at our regional convention where we saw those forces coming against God's people and then what did we see? Well, suddenly from the heavens, here is Jesus Christ the 144,000 and all those heavenly armies riding into battle. And you remember Jesus just pulls back that bow and lets that arrow go, and all of those enemies are gone forever. Brothers and sisters, don't you just long for the day when you will see those things with your own eyes. What a wonderful time that will be when we experience the salvation of Jehovah. Well, that's pretty much all I've got for you. You'll be relieved to know and we've ended on probably the most fanatical doomsday rhetoric from the Friday morning of the Always Rejoice convention. Mark Sanderson getting very excited at the prospect of all people who don't follow him, all non-Jehovah's Witnesses, being annihilated for the crime of not recognising his authority. That's what being a Jehovah's Witness is all about. Relishing the destruction of people who don't agree with your religion. I'm sorry, in a nutshell, that's what it is. He's reading there from the Pure Worship book, a fairly new publication. In fact, I think I have it behind me. Uh, yeah. So this is the book that he is reading from. And I hope you noticed some of the language there. Because basically they don't know what they're saying and they're just making it up as they go along. They can't resist putting in words here and there that give away the fact that they're just basically making this up. So for example, before they are destroyed, our enemies will see... The sign of the Son of Man, likely a supernatural manifestation of the power of Jehovah and Jesus. They have to put in the word likely because they're speaking gibberish. They're just totally making things up. And then further on, Jehovah will no doubt unleash heavenly armies and natural forces in such a way that he protects his loyal servants but eliminates his enemies that's the sort of half-hearted language you're going to read in the pure worship book because again the writers don't have a clue they're just mostly making things up as they go along the main priority both for the writers of the publications and the people putting together this material for the 2020 Always Rejoice convention is control. We want control of Jehovah's Witnesses. So we're going to take something as innocent and harmless as joy. And we're going to find a way to make joy mean follow us. Do as we tell you spend all of your time serving our organization that's the only way that you can find joy so i think we've had enough <laughs> from the friday morning of the convention look out for part two in which we will be looking at the material from the afternoon of the friday of the always rejoice convention but that's everything I have for you in this video. Don't forget to subscribe to the John Cedars channel for more such videos. And as always, thank you for watching.